Hi, everybody. Hi. This is John here. This is Paul. George. And Ringo. And we're very happy to be on your program once again. Hello, everyone. This is Steve Marinucci. Welcome to show 73 of Beatle News Briefs, your home for all the news you need to know and the best talk from the Beatles world. I'm your host, and on this show, contributing editor and author of Beatleness, Candy Leonard, and myself, we'll talk about what was going on at the time Abbey Road was released, and we'll also give some thoughts about the recently released set. But first, here's the latest news. Paul McCartney announced this week he'll release two new tracks digitally from the Egypt Station sessions on November 22nd, followed by a vinyl double 7-inch picture disc for Black Friday Record Store Day on November 29th. The tracks are Home Tonight and In a Hurry. The artwork on the disc will be based on the parlor game, Exquisite Corpse, which I have to say I know nothing about, and the disc will come with a lyric insert. Those two tracks were not on the recent Egypt Station Deluxe releases. October 9th would have been the 79th birthday of John Lennon. The John Lennon Twitter account posted this. Today, October 9th, we celebrate John Lennon's 79th birthday. Please share your favorite John Lennon lyrics, songs, and quotes, and tag them with John Lennon to send his words of wisdom around the world. We start with, quote, Imagine all the people living life in peace. And Yoko Ono tweeted out, Dear friends, tonight we relight Imagine Peace Tower in Reykjavik, Iceland, in memory of John Lennon on his 79th birthday. Join us and make a wish at http slash slash imaginepeacetower.com. Love, Yoko. Paul McCartney tweeted out, Happy John birthday to us all, and happy anniversary to Nancy. He and Nancy were married on October 9th. And meanwhile, Ringo, good old Ringo, tweeted out, I don't know about you, but it's a she said, she said, Wednesday birthday boy for me. Peace and love. Thank you, Ringo. In other news, the Beatles' Abbey Road album returned to number one in the UK this past week on officialcharts.com in the UK and number three on the Billboard Hot 200 here in the US. The Billboard spot was up an astounding 88 places from the previous week, which Billboard labeled the album The Greatest Gainer. Paul McCartney tweeted, It's hard to believe that Abbey Road still holds up after all these years, but then again, It's a bloody cool album. Also on the Billboard 200 this week are The Beatles 1 at 48, up 18 places from last week. The Beatles' White Album re-entering the chart at 165. On the vinyl chart, Abbey Road was at number 2, up 9 places. And on the Billboard Artist 100, The Beatles were number 3, up from, are you ready, number 58 last week and number 79 two weeks ago. It was a big week for the Beatles also on the UK official charts listings. In addition to Abbey Road at the number one spot on the official charts top 100 albums, the Beatles one was at 28, up from 38. Sgt. Pepper re-entered the chart at 69. Uh, 67 to 70 re-entered the chart at 72. And the Beatles' White Album re-entered the chart at 94. Abbey Road was also number one on the official chart's vinyl album chart, which also listed Sgt. Pepper at 33, down from 27 the previous week. And if you're looking ahead, Giles Martin, in an interview with Paul Moody of Uncut Magazine, gave a slight hint that we could be seeing another box set next year. Asked what's next in the pipeline, he said, The next project is working with Peter Jackson on Let It Be. That is our next Beatles mission, so the plan is to tie it with the 50th anniversary next year. And now, here's contributing editor Candy Leonard, the distinguished author of the great book Beatleness and myself, talking about the life and times of the Abbey Road album and what was happening in the world when it was released. We also talk about our thoughts on the box set. We'll have more news after this segment, so stick around. I'm here with contributing editor and author of the great book, Beatleness, Candy Leonard. And we're here to talk about the new Abbey Road set. Candy has been listening to it, and I have too, as those of you who heard the last show know. And we're going to talk a little bit 
not only about the music, but we're also going to talk about the times in which the original album was released. And Candy's going to put a little sociological spin on the whole thing. I mean, let's talk about 1969, Candy. What was going on in the world in 1969? Well, um, a lot. But even if we limit it to the fall of 1969, which is when Abbey Road was released, or summer of 69, let's say, the weeks leading up to the release, there was quite a bit going on. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, there was the, well, John and Yoko had their bed-ins in late May, early June was the second bed-in. Then we had, I look, I, I was thinking about all this, and then I finally decided to write it out chronologically. Then <laughs> June 28th, we have Stonewall Riots in New York. Uh, July 3rd, Brian Jones died. Um, Chappaquiddick, July 18th. Mm-hmm. Moon, moon Landing, July 20th. Manson Murders, August 9th. Woodstock, um, August 15th through 18th. Um, and then what are we okay so uh abbey road comes out like a month or so approximately after woodstock um and of course the poll is dead and can't start shortly after that um but then or, like, let's for a moment just continue with early october um the days of rage in chicago at the uh, the trial of the chicago eight was making big news the new york mets defeated the orioles which was a big deal um and I, I remember that, especially, as you know, I'm not a baseball follower, but um, I saw one of my first, I think it might have been the first concert I ever went to was Donovan at Madison Square Garden in early October, or is right after, I think it might have been that actual like, days after the, or the day of that Mets victory, and he actually mentioned it, <laughs> which I thought was kind of funny. Anyway, then the October 15th, the moratorium. Um, in Washington, D.C. and all around the country, the, the peace mar- marches against the war. November 3rd, Nixon's silent majority speech. Uh, and then the other moratorium in a uh, big march in November where um, Pete Seeger and led the crowd in um, Give Peace a Chance. John returns his MBE in November. So I'm giving a little bit away. But Abbey Road kind of fell in the, you know, this was the context for Abbey Road. Mm-hmm. And while the album is not political at all, um, it it was a you know it was it was highly anticipated and it was really loved from the moment it came around. So looking at all these historical events and Abbey Road drops in the middle of all this, and while it was not at all political, it has nothing to do with any of this of these events. There is a sense in which it does have something to do with them. I think fans just embraced it immediately. You know, we think about that they this remix, which it, it's hard to imagine how something that was already so beautiful, crisp, clear could get even more that way. But it it really, I think that um, I think it was appreciated then for its it had it had a brilliance about it, even though it also had a finality to it i think there was a sense that this was it and i think that fans kind of knew that and maybe that also could have contributed to the you know the the glomming onto it the embracing of it the celebrating of it Um, and of course the cover is a whole other we could do a whole show on the cover which has become one of the most iconic I, i don't think it's hyperbole to say that the cover of Abbey Road is one of the most iconic images of the 20th century. Just to put a, an anchor on when the album was released, it was September 26th. Right. And what's interesting about all of that is that it was kind of a, it was a return to a group album because yeah. basically, I mean, everybody thought that the White Album was kind of a solo album for each of them, uh, and then you had Yellow Submarine, which only had a few songs, and you also and it also had you know a bunch of instrumentals from the movie. But here was a full out group album, right? Right, okay. and I think that that came through too. I think that's part of what makes it so lovable is the the vocals, the the harmonies, you know, the, the literal and metaphorical harmony that kind of permeates the whole thing. Mm-hmm. And then you had the cover, as you say, was, you know, one of the most iconic and still 
is probably the ongoing symbol of the of the group. Never mind the Paul is dead stuff, which right. I think the it, Paul is dead thing added to the cover's iconic stature, if you will. But you know, when you think of, I mean, Sergeant Pepper, of course, also kind of in this category where it has been, you know, appropriated for different kinds of artwork and different variations. I mean, I don't know how many variations I, I've seen in the hundreds of, you know, sort of interesting, funny mashups or, or ways of presenting the, you know, the, the, the basic iconography of Abbey Road. It's, it's just, it's amazing. And it, it's, a, there's something, it's almost like, I don't know, there's something very comforting about it. And I think that, um, again, when you think about when it was released at the time of great political turmoil 50 years ago, um, it, 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 you know, like everything that was going on in that decade, all the, by the end, certainly the violence, the weirdness, the, the, the war, the, the draft lottery had started. There was a lot of edgy uncertainty for young people. And so the Beatles were, you know, they were so, they were still at it and still delighting us even at the end of the decade. The album itself is, is, brilliantly put together um the medley on the side on the second side oh it's great it's not, i it's mean not, it's not something you would have expected them to do you i mean because all because up to that point they had done individual songs they had not concocted something like a, a medley and that was like an orchestral work really and then it just came at you know, like these little things and each one you know I was, i've been listening to it a lot recently at the last few days and i've been listening especially to the uh medley because i just love it so much and what i'm noticing too that as i get older and as i listen to it through the ears i have today it's it's like there's more there it's just so wonderful mm-hmm. and, and, and- uh, I, I, each, I just want to say, each snippet, like the the person, their their personalities come through. There's like now this, now this. Like it, it's just it's just a wonderful experience. The the you know one of the things that hit me I think very hard when I first heard the album was Ringo's drum solo because oh that was that was so unexpected, and it was like I mean it, it, we all knew Ringo was a a great drummer, but that drum solo really you know pushed him to the forefront after really after, after being in the background for so long and that's one thing that the Beatles have been doing the last few years is making Ringo uh, giving Ringo more of a prominent role and and you know and saying that Ringo we love you you know, well, you know, uh, it's interesting. I think you can say that about George as well, because the, the, George, you know, something and here comes the sun on the same record is pretty amazing and really um, shows, you know, how, the songwriter that, that George became. So just as that solo, you know, kind of seals a place for Ringo, if you will. Uh, not that he's gone in the way, you know, it's different, different issues, but I think you can, like, it also establishes George in a way. And, you know, if you, um, here comes the sun is the most downloaded Beatles song, apparently across different streaming services. And if you, I saw that I was visiting my um, five-year-old grandson recently, and he's very, uh, he uses echo and he's like, echo play Beatles. Anybody who says Echo Play Beatles, the first thing that comes up is Here Comes the Sun. Mm-hmm. And I guess after a while that becomes the algorithm, so it comes up because it comes up. But it, but it is one of their most beloved songs. Right. And, and interesting that on the box set, the outtakes of both of those songs are two of the real highlights, especially yeah. especially something that instrumental part of something was such a surprise oh, yeah. i was i i i was floored when i first heard that i had never you know that was amazing yeah i was listening to it today i think it's a better love song than yesterday i was i i was uh, I, I i talked about that with john curlander the engineer one of the engineers on the album and i asked him i think i i just said if it was as good as yesterday but yeah that whole 
the the way George went at that lyric. It's more um, mature, you know, I mean, as mature as yesterday was, and people rightly so marvel at how could a 21 year old write such a profound song. Like, I'm not saying, I mean, I still believe, it, you know, I'm not denigrating yesterday at all, but I think as a love song, it's a better song. It's the lyrics are more mature. And musically, I think it's a little more interesting than yesterday. That's interesting that you call it a more mature. Uh, I, it's it's a whole different perspective to say something in the way she moves. I, and that, I mean, I'm not faulting your description. I'm just saying that's not something I, that's not the way I would have looked at it. But. Well, because I mean, I think that, you know, Paul is a great songwriter. He all, He's been a great songwriter since he was 16. And I think that yesterday is an example of that but it's also dare i say has an almost formulaic emotional Mm -hmm. script that a 21 year old might embrace because i I don't know it's it's you know i haven't really i had that insight this morning so i haven't thought it through (laughs) much more than that but it maybe mature isn't quite it's more sophisticated more authentic maybe as a little i don't know remember too that the the songs that he worked on were also uh, worked on with John so that there were two voices there exactly. instead right. of one. Whereas with something there was, that wasn't the case. There was only, you know, that was George by himself. That was uh-huh. George's perspective. Yeah. But I think Andrew yeah. Wood is a real vindication of George. I really do in a lot of ways. I mean, it's all, I mean, you know, like they all shine for sure. Everyone, all four of them. But there's, but George, it, it's a, it, it elevates his stat status. It, those two songs are just brilliant. There's a clip that I found that for the, anyone who's listening that didn't hear the last show should probably listen to because I found this clip of Paul being asked what his favorite songs were on the album and he mentioned something and he said George really comes on his own. He actually said that yeah. in the in the clip. And that was that when I found that and when I heard that I was like, wow, that He said this recently? Like since No I... no no no. This was back in the day. This oh, was oh, oh, back oh. then when oh. the album first came out. Mm-hmm. He said that, and he rec- so he recognized it in '69. Yeah, and that it's a great song. I mean, and here comes the sun. I mean, it, it's just you know. I, I mean, I, I I think that that's becoming almost you know for future generations what what's the song they associate with them, and I think it's it's narrowing down to possibly at some point that's going to be the song people think of. Mm-hmm. I I, I want to while I remember it I uh, want to point people to also to the I mentioned the John Curlander interview I did that uh, for Billboard um, about a week before we're, we were recording this and um, so if you go to the Billboard dot com site and look my name up um, or look up Abbey Road you'll see the interview with John Curlander and he talks about uh, several things about the album including his role in getting Her Majesty on the album. Uh, I think probably most people or a lot of you that are listening know that story, but for those of you that don't, he talks about that in the article. Um, happy mistake. So, I'm sorry? It was like a happy co- you know, mistake that they decided to keep, um, but I don't know. I think... It's it's it strikes me as a little pretentious, frankly. Really? Well, to this day, I, you know, when I first heard that, it was kind of a shock. I, re- in fact, I remember, uh, for some odd reason, I wasn't, aw- I had not seen the album, or I hadn't, I, I was kind of at that. This is 1969, so you know, and I was working uh, in. Uh, I was in the newspaper at the time, working in the newspaper business. I wasn't an editor. I was just a a low life support person at that point. You're awfully young. I started while I was still in high school. They hired me before I I even went into college. They weren't supposed to, but they did. I had just 13 when Abbey Road came out. And I walked into the, I walked into the photo lab and they had, they had the cover sitting there Mm -hmm. and I had not, I had not seen the cover. And I looked at it and I was like, 
Wow. Yeah, it's wow, right? It's just wow, right off the top. It's just wow. Mm-hmm. It still is. <laughs> still, it still is. It, it still, still is. is. It's just, you know, there's just something about it, something. Um, I, I think in in terms of surprise and delight, it probably beats out Sergeant Pepper, you know, in terms of what we were expecting and what we got. And so... Well, they're both, I mean, they're different. They're, they're, they're both images that you could spend a lot of time with. And I think that's part of why they have this iconic status, because you can look at it and look at it again and again and again and see more in it. And it's, I don't know, there's just something delightful and engaging about both of those images, as there is about the Beatles in general. So. Well, yeah, and but in this particular case with them walking across the street, it's like they're normal people exactly and, and that's what you know that's yeah. the thing that uh i and think motion and it's dynamic mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and you've got the little volkswagen park there and you yeah, know which the, they actually wanted moved but couldn't make that happen right but um, yeah so you know the whole i mean the whole setup for that cover is it, that and also and we never did, really did get into it but the cover of the white album too i mean that was <laughs> kind of that was kind of very cool i mean a lot of their covers revolver yeah so you know they, well, they, I, feel they have, like, I feel like my aesthetic sense and my photograph you know like how i like as a, you know i take pictures or as a photographer or just like how i my aesthetic sense i think was to a large extent um, informed by Beatle covers and Beatle pictures when I was during my formative years, I really do. We could do, yeah, we we could do a whole show on Beatle album covers. That might be, you know, that that might be an interesting discussion at some point. One of the things, though, that really caught my attention was the clarity and the beauty of Paul singing "Oh, Darling," the the opening where he goes, where he uh, comes in with that that beautiful voice and. That was really nice to hear. They did a, they did a great job uh, with uh, you know with remixing this and bringing the elements out that you haven't heard before or that you haven't been able to hear as well before. And I mean that's what remixes are all about anyway. I mean it's, it's almost like you somehow it manages to bring out more sound, more instruments, more layers, so you hear more, but yet. It doesn't sound noisy or dirty or messy. It, it somehow you hear more, but yet it sounds crisper and cleaner. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, the album was that way to begin with. Yes. It was not, yes. it, it was not a noisy album. It was not a, a cluttered album. Right. And, and that all has to do, obviously, with George Martin's original um, mixing. But, um, you know, I mean, Giles, you know, um, built on that, and he did it. I think he did a a great job, uh, you know. And I'm glad. I'm glad you don't. We don't have to go into the discussion of will people have to buy it to hear it. I'm glad that there are ways for people to hear this without buying it, you know, as through you know through the streaming services. And you know, for those who don't know, uh, uh, Spotify has a free version that you have to put up with commercials, but that you can sit there and listen to it. And so that's a, that's a good thing. And of course, uh, Amazon music has it. Apple music has it. All the streaming services do. So if you have any of the other streaming services, you can hear it that way. The Beatles are once again, very much on the cultural landscape. You know, I mean, they've been for 50 plus years, but it, it ebbs and flows. And this is a flow moment. I think the, Beatles and still remaining on the you know in our consciousness. And if you have not bought Candy's book, buy Candy's book. You will learn much about Beatle fans. More of what kind of what we talk about here. Mm-hmm. But well, you, you'll look, it puts the whole phenomenon into a historical and personal context of how what it was like to grow up with them. In, in that moment to experience them in real time while you were going through your childhood and adolescence and young adulthood and how they impacted it. And they, as we know, cause we're still sitting here talking about that impact. It was quite profound. 
it was. It was indeed. Go check out Beetle Ness. Yes. What's it, who's the publisher? Uh, Skyhorse Arcade. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you again, Candy, and <laughs> we will be right back. Because Atlantic City is in first place now, there's a strong tendency for the owners of smaller clubs and dance halls to push up their prices. Where you paid a dollar to go in before, it's two dollars now, and you'd be lucky to get a glass of beer for less than five shillings. But you can see the Beatles for nothing when they come to the city. That is, if you make a long enough booking at one of the hotels, offering free tickets as bait for totting up a really healthy bill. In the end, I should think it's cheaper to buy a ticket from a tout on the night. And we're back with more news. In celebration of what would have been John Lennon's 79th birthday, Theatre Within, the grassroots nonprofit behind the annual John Lennon tribute since 1981, announced more artists for its upcoming 39th annual concert. The concert takes place December 6th at Symphony Space in New York City. In addition to artist-activist Natalie Merchant, who will be honored as the sixth recipient of the John Lennon Real Love Award, the concert will also feature performances by Joan Osborne, Rachel Yamagata, Sam Amidon, Willie Nile, and Ray Z- Zaragoza, backed by a drummer led by uh, Rich Pagano, one of the founding members of the Fab Fo. And more artists will be announced. Proceeds from the tribute will support Theater Within's ongoing free workshops in songwriting, art, meditation, and more at Gilda's Club New York City for those whose lives have been impacted by cancer. Workshops include the John Lennon Real Love Project, a visionary songwriting program for children, which will be made available to public schools and libraries in the New York Tri-State area in the spring of 2020. Tickets for the 39th Annual Tribute are currently sold out, but additional seats may be released for sale. For seat availability, visit LennonTribute.org or call the Symphony Space box office at 212-864-5400 Tuesday through Sunday from 1 p.m. to 6 p.m. A limited number of VIP packages with up-close center orchestra seats are available at LennonTribute.org slash join-friends. That's LennonTribute.org slash join-friends. Theater Within's annual John Lennon Tribute is produced in association with Music Without Borders, and it is the only ongoing John Lennon Tribute in the world sanctioned by Yoko Ono. And if you're in the L.A. area, there's a Festival of George Harrison Link Films this month. It begins with the first showing of a new documentary, An Accidental Studio, which includes appearances by Ray Cooper, Terry Gilliam, and Michael Palin. There's also a new movie called Lucy in the Sky, starring Natalie Portman, that isn't expressly about the Beatles like yesterday was, but it does include a cover of Lucy in the Sky with diamonds. The latest issue of the McCartney Fanzine magazine, Volume 47, Issue Number 1, crossed our doorstep today. The headline on the magazine is The Birth of Wings, June 71 to February 72. It's a great magazine, and we recommend it highly. Their website is www.mccartneymagazine, that's M-A-C-C-A-Z-I-N-E dot com. That's all one word, mccartneymagazine dot com. Here's some of what is streaming this month. Eight Days a Week, The Touring Years is on Hulu. Hard Day's Night is on the Criterion Channel. Good Old Frida is on Hoopla. Beatles One is on Roku. Strange Fruit, The Beatles' Apple Years is on Tubi. That's T-U-B-I. Nowhere Boy is on Netflix and Showtime. The U.S. vs. John Lennon is streaming free on Vudu, Tubi, and IMDb TV. John and Yoko, Above Us Only Sky is on Netflix and also just out on DVD and Blu-ray. Looking for Lennon is on Amazon Prime. Sound City with Paul McCartney is on Amazon Prime. Lennon Naked is on BritBox. Produced by George Martin is on Amazon Prime and Tubi. George Harrison, Living in the Material World, is on Tubi. Life of Brian is on Netflix and Sling. George Harrison, A Beetle in Benton, Illinois, is on Amazon Prime. The Kids Are All Right with Ringo is on Amazon Prime and Tubi. The Point and Candy, both with Ringo, are on Tubi. 
Who is Harry Nilsson and Why is Everybody Talking About Me? Also with Ringo is on Tubi. The Last Waltz, also with Ringo, is on Roku and Hoopla. Sextet with, are you ready, Ringo, Mae West, Alice Cooper, and Keith Moon, all in the same movie, is on Amazon Prime. That'll be the day again with Ringo, and I'll warn you, that one's got a a Ringo nude scene, is on Amazon Prime. And finally, Water with George Harrison, a pretty rare film, is on the Criterion channel. And though it's been dismissed by as being by the Beatles, the song Peace of Mind, The Candle Burns has never completely gone away. We found an interesting remix of the song on YouTube. <laughs> That's it for now. You can catch our shows on fab4radio.com, beatlesarama.com, and also YouTube, iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or wherever you get your podcasts. Please join our Beatles News and Information Group on Facebook for the latest in the Beatles world, and check out our That's What I Want Beatles Store page on Facebook for gift ideas for yourself or, or your favorite people, and where you can find links for both contributing editor Candy Leonard's Beatleness book and my meet a monkey davy jones ebook and please look for our next show and we'd also love to have you subscribe so you get first word on our shows we'll be looking for you next time till then this is steve marinucci saying be seeing you that one market fab